All right, let's start with uh, chapter 10, the classical long run policy model, growth and supply side. Just to do a little bit of review, we said that first there was classical economics, and then we got a Keynesian revolution, which was the beginning of macroeconomics. And we said a revolution tends to turn everything upside down, completely topsy-turvy. And it's completely disorienting to those people who were fixed in a way of thinking about the economic reality. Once Keynes comes along, all of a sudden everything's turned backwards and different and completely the opposite. And so it's called a Keynesian revolution. So in this chapter, we're going to be talking about that classical long-run growth model. And an economist that typifies that perspective would be a French economist. And I don't speak French very well, but I guess his name is pronounced Jean-Baptiste Say, S-A-Y. Jean-Baptiste Say. Of course, we said that our study of economics really began with a famous man who wrote a famous book in a famous year and had a famous metaphor. And that famous year was 1776, and Say was born in 1767. So it's very, he, was a, he was a pretty young person when, Keynes, uh, Keynes, when Adam Smith's book, Wealth of Nations, came out. And so he came on the scene shortly after that. And Keynes had a phrase and that he said from early, I think it was um, Ricardo, I think it was David Ricardo who was talking about, and say that the classical view said that Production or supply creates its own demand. Keynes um, paraphrased Say's law. And according to Keynes, Say's law was that supply creates its own demand. That was his paraphrase. And of course, Keynes turned that on his head, that saying on his head, and said, no, 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 supply doesn't create its own demand. Demand creates its own supply. So again, he's taking the classical view and he's turning it around. So rather than take John Maynard Keynes' summary of Say's Law, and of course, Keynes was demand side, and say is all about productivity and supply side. So rather than productivity and looking at increasing the amount of goods and services, Keynes was focusing on consumption, and that would be demand side. Say's law is the idea that production itself creates or is the source of economic demand still a little bit cryptic. Um, so I could say it slightly differently to say that there can be no demand for goods and services unless there is a supply of goods and services to demand. Now if I could put my spin on that and try to explain it in my own words, I would say that my ability to create economic demand for my food and clothing and shelter, that my ability to demand those things depends upon my productivity in supplying other things that people need. To the extent that I can supply things that other people need, at the caveat here, at prices they can afford, and that's where that productivity thing comes in, I've got to be productive. I've got to be able to do this very productively, very efficiently. If I can produce goods and services that 
people want and can afford to buy, then that is the source of my ability to demand food and shelter and goods. So we're saying that the supply, my supply of things, create my demand for things, which is what John Baptiste said, say, would say. Or is Keynes saying, no, 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 you got it backwards. Really, what really starts this ball moving is people want stuff, people need stuff. And when people want and need things, then they go out and they create the demand. And because of the demand, then people will start producing things. Of course, say, the idea of say, the, the argument of say comes back and said, well, people have always wanted things. You don't have to tell people to want more. You don't have to tell people that they need a bigger car or more vacations or more movies, more pictures in their house or a bigger house. Or, that is not everybody wants more. The problem they, is that they cannot afford more. So how can they afford more? If people become more productive, we can take for the same amount of resources, we can create more goods and services at a price they could afford because we're being more productive. Well, then that is what is going to create the economic demand. So what starts this chicken and egg process? Does it start with productivity and supply, as Say's Law says? Or does it really begin with getting people to desire and go out there and want to buy more stuff? Now that's the debate. That, that's how the debate has been formulated and that's how it's been structured. I want to come back to that when I talk about the classical growth model in a second. But next I want to talk about two different kinds of capital, human capital and social capital. But first we have to make sure we know what we mean by capital. For a, quite a few years now, economists thought that we could measure, quantitatively measure capital. Um, through a, almost an accounting method. How many service trucks does this company have? How many punch, mach, punch press machines do they have? Uh, how many tables and chairs does this college have? How many classrooms do they have? How many computers do they have in the labs? That we could actually count up the amount of capital and convert it into dollars because we knew that capital played an essential role in economic growth and economic productivity. In an earlier lecture, I think I mentioned a four-letter word for capital. Remind me if I'm wrong, but does it sound familiar that we mentioned the word capital? Louder. Tool. When we think of capital, we think of some sort of tool. Now, when you think of a tool, I don't know if you're like me, but without the right tools, I get really frustrated. Um, I was on a construction site, and uh, one of the members on that construction site, when I was working my way through college, he was uh, working on his master's degrees, degree in physics, but he was kind of one of these um, really geeky, Einstein-y sort of people, and he could do great and wonderful things with mathematical models. But as a craftsperson, as a hands-on person, he's really kind of klutzy. <laughs> I couldn't make things work very well. But intellectually, he was awfully good. And he would often pontificate as we were taking a break or something like that. And um, I don't know. It's just a sense of humor when somebody's really expounding on how bright they are and I don't know we, we had the we're passing on a bottle or something and uh, on, a, on a job we would take a just a short trowel and put it underneath the cap and pop the top of the soda pop bottle you know I mean if you had a good trowel you could pop it right off there and so we're passing this trial down, and he got it. He was talking away, telling us about Einstein's theory of relativity or something like that. 
and he was working on this thing and talking away, <laughs> talking away. And we just started to chuckle because he could tell us all these very, very high things, but he couldn't get the cap off the top of his pop bottle. We just thought that was kind of funny. Now, why I'm telling you that, I, I, I guess I'm telling you that because the only way we could get that off there, because we didn't have an opener you put on there, we had to get some sort of tool to get that off the top. In the movie, only in the movies do they take a bottle and they smash the top off of it and then drink it, right? That, that, that only happens in the movie. You've got to take the top off, really, right? Okay. And I really don't recommend, and I've seen it done, but I cringe every time I see it, the people that actually, that one scares me too. That one really scares me. I don't, that's not advisable. I really don't advise that sort of thing. But you need a tool to get that thing off there. Now, without that tool, you're really kind of stuck for something to drink with your sandwich. Tools help us accomplish our ends. To get the top off that pop bottle, we want to quench our thirst. Without that tool, it's going to be kind of difficult. So the tool is not just a thing. A tool is some device that helps us get to our economic goal or our economic end. So that tool really is a device to help us accomplish some economic goal, and it's that economic goal which provides the wealth, the supply, the something that people want or need in somebody's mind. Oh, let me try to give you another il illustration of a tool here. Uh, let's say that um, outside of our village here, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of grass growing out there, and some terrorist comes along and sows the whole thing in salt. Because the whole thing's sown in salt, nothing will grow. But if everyone in the village wasn't using that field, had no idea for how we could make any use of that field, well, then they haven't damaged us at all because nobody was going to grow a garden. Nobody knew how to grow a garden. Nobody wanted to make hay. And so the fact that it was sown in salt didn't hurt us at all because we didn't have any ideas on how to make that resource useful. But on the other hand, let's say that we were a farmer and we want to grow hay or we're in the truck farming vegetable production business and I know a lot of young guys that would love to be farmers the only problem is farms are awfully expensive I mean it's a whole lot of capital to go out there and buy a farm you just don't say oh I'm going to be a farmer I mean you guys are pretty small so if he wants to be a farmer and there's some land out there and he can have access to it he's thinking I would like to grow organic vegetables. That's what I would really like to do. And I've got these great and wonderful ideas of testing the pH of the soil and foiler feeding and all these. I'll even play music to this these plants to make them grow faster. And I'll, I'll check them for their sugar content to make sure they're as nutritious as possible. And I've got all these great and wonderful ideas. Well, then if somebody has an idea of how to use that land, now that land becomes capital. Now it becomes a tool. When nobody knew what to do with it, it wasn't a tool because it didn't help anybody reach any economic goal or any economic objective. But as soon as somebody thought of an idea of, hey, that would work out really well for an organic vegetable farm, that's what I want for an organic. Now that plot of ground becomes capital. Now, notice when it became capital. It became capital not because of it was sowed in salt, not because it was sitting there. It became capital when somebody had an idea how to use that resource to reach an economic end that they wanted to achieve. So to the extent that somebody comes up with a good idea to how to use a physical resource, to that end, it is a valuable piece of capital. But notice that capital and the value of that capital really boils down to the quality of the idea of the entrepreneur.
friend of mine had a bulldozer. He wanted to use the bulldozer, but the undercarriage is a really important part. And uh, he knew about that, and so he could tell what a good price for that bulldozer would be. I would have no clue. I don't know what undercarriage is. I don't know how much it costs to put treads on those things or cleats or whatever they are. Um, but for him, he was saying, I've got an idea that if I could get that bulldozer to work, I've got a couple things that I could do with that that could make me a lot of money. I know people I could help with that bulldozer. So to the extent that he's got a plan and vision for that bulldozer, it could turn into a very, very productive tool. But if he wasn't around and didn't have that expertise and that knowledge and that entrepreneurial spirit of what could be done with that pile of metal, well then, whoever is first to take it to mill iron to get it melted down, that's the only value that that hunk of metal is, would be its meltdown value. But if somebody else can come up with an idea that's better than that, we could turn that into capital. Now that's the role of capital. Capital allows us to have a more productive, prosperous economy by making us more efficient in terms of our human productivity. We can accomplish more with less with tools than without tools. One of the reasons you're taking these college classes is because you're equipping yourself with mental tools. That when you come across a task, you have got some mental models, some perspectives, some ideas on how to use things that just wouldn't occur to somebody that was just off the street who had never taken a class because they haven't had that sort of equipment, they haven't been given those resources in order to see how they could accomplish particular ends. Now we're going to stop right here and we're going to begin by taking this idea of capital and boiling it down to two parts called human capital and social capital.